It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Records from Ontario Health show 1,400 people died while waiting for surgery last year. That's a 43 per cent increase compared to pre-pandemic years and a 30 per cent increase over just the year before. When lives hang in the balance, why is the Premier refusing to invest in recruiting, retaining and respecting health care workers? To reply, the Premier. Well, I, I want to thank uh, the opposition for the, the question. The, the facts are, uh, recruiting and retaining, we added 14,500 14, new nurses. That's on top of the 10,500 health care workers, which included nurses and PSWs. We invested over $40 billion in 52 projects that were neglected under your government. Under their government, propped up by the, the Liberals and NDP, they fired 1,600 nurses. I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, the opposition voted against historic funding, which went from $61 billion when we came into office in 2018, up to over $75 billion. That's over $14 billion increase. They voted no against it for the historic funding. They voted no against the people of Montreal. They voted no against the health care system. That's their solution. The supplementary question. Well, reality doesn't reflect what the Premier is talking about. The Toronto Star has obtained a letter painting a picture of the staffing crisis at St. Joe's in Toronto, a shutdown of ambulatory care due to a lack of nurses, hallway medicine, no functional resuscitation area, a small, sick child in an unstaffed area. The staffing crisis is costing people their lives. Why is this government planning to spend money on privatization that will bleed even more staff from our hospitals? Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's funny you mentioned St. Joe's. I had a, a great conversation with Dr. Rutledge this, this morning uh, regarding that. He's giving me the confidence that we're going to move forward. And by the way, the backlog surgeries, we put $300 million into backlog surgeries to make sure we get caught up, and we're, we're doing exactly that. We're building a new medical school that's going to create more doctors into the system. As we did the, the last year, over 720 new doctors are coming into the system, Mr. Speaker. We are investing in health care like no other government in the history of this country. Ever. But the opposition, their answer is the status quo. The status quo that destroyed this health care system under 15 years of their rule, the NDP and the Liberals, that crumbled the health care system. We're fixing the health care system. We're putting in historic funding. We're making sure that we put through processes that are going to make sure that people aren't in the emergency rooms for hours on top of hours. We're fixing the health care system, the same system that they destroyed for 15 years, Mr. Speaker. And the final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Canadian studies show that for-profit hospitals had 19 per cent higher costs and a 2 per cent higher death rate compared to non-profit hospitals. Canadian medical experts attribute this difference to profit-seeking, higher costs for administration and bigger executive bonuses. We have a hospital staffing crisis. Privatization would siphon staff out of our hospitals and send them to a for-profit system. Why is this government planning to spend money on privatization that would make the hospital staffing crisis even worse? Premier. Mr. Speaker, no one in this province, as long as our government is here, no one will have to pay with their credit card. They'll be paying with their OHIP card. Not their credit card, OHIP. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. We added 3,500 beds, and with a historic $40 billion investment with 52 regions around Ontario that are either getting a new hospital or a new addition, we're adding another 3,000 beds, Mr. Speaker. 
We're working with the College of Nurses, working with the College of uh, uh, Physicians as well and Surgeons to make sure we speed up the process. As we saw, over 720 internationally trained nurses are now coming into the system. We need a lot more. We're going to continue asking the College of Nurses to speed up the process to bring all these qualified nurses right here in Ontario. Response. Mr. Speaker, we are fixing a broken system we inherited and we'll continue to have a thriving system moving forward. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Beds don't equal surgery, Speaker. A bed without a nurse is just furniture. At the Ottawa Hospital, we're seeing the many serious consequences of not having enough nurses. Patients are waiting days to be admitted even though beds are available because there's no nurse to staff the bed. Surgeries are being cancelled even as patients are entering the operating room because there's no nurse. And recently, a patient who showed up for chemo was sent home without it because there was no nurse to administer it. Will the government act swiftly to fill these nursing shortages so that every patient in Ontario gets the care they need? Reply. Well, thank you for uh, that question. And, and by the way, I spoke to Cam Love. What a great CEO, probably one of the best in the, in the province. And, you know, he assured me as well that they're going to make sure that they have the proper staffing. And how we're helping the, the hospitals across the province is a stay and learn program that we're going to pay for the tuition of the nurses. We're going to make sure that they're taken care of for any expenses they have as long as they serve in underserved areas. And with, with Ottawa, I, I got to tell you, I think the world of, of Cam Love, he drives an efficient hospital. But again, as he said, and every other CEO that are feeding us information to help the system, every one of them said the same thing. You can't stay with the status quo under the Liberals and NDP that destroyed this system for 15 years, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue investing into the hospitals, into nurses, and again, I just want to remind people the Response. numbers. We added 14,500 nurses since 2018. Those are staggering numbers. The supplementary question. It feels like there's two realities here, Speaker, the one the government is living in and the one that my constituents and our hard-working health care workers live in. The Ottawa Hospital is short more than 500 nurses, and this government's actions to date are a drop in the bucket compared to the scale of the crisis. There are nurses in Ottawa who are working 16-hour shifts, 12 out of 14 days, Speaker, just to fill nursing shortages. Just imagine trying to provide good care while working that many hours, not to mention the risk of mistakes. No wonder nurses are leaving the profession. Will the government repeal Bill 124 and address working conditions so that we keep nurses instead of driving them away? Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As, as you propped it up, the Liberals, and you fired 1,600 nurses, we actually recognized the nurses and gave them a 7.6 per cent increase, a $5,000 thank you bonus for doing an incredible job. We're investing another $342 million to add 5,000 more nurses to the system. We're adding 8,000 personal support workers, Mr. Speaker. We're investing $57 million to hire 225 nurses, the long-term care sector that are desperately needed. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to invest in health care. We're going to continue making sure that as long as our government's here, people are going to be using the OHIP card instead of the credit card. But guess what? We can't do the same status quo. Status quo has been broken. We're going to fix it. We're going to deliver health care in a different fashion through the sector's advice, not through our government's advice, through the experts' advice, the docs, the nurses, Response. anyone involved in, care, in, in taking care of the, the great health care system that we do have in Ontario. I remind the members to make their comments to the chair. Final supplementary. Well, now I know, Speaker, that the government lives in an alternate reality because I've never fired a nurse or propped up the Liberals in my life. Last week, I had the chance to sit down with nurses from ONA Local 83, and they told me that every day they go to work feeling scared. They wonder, who will I not get to today, and what will the consequences be? It is only a matter of time until the consequences for someone are deadly. This is an unfair burden to put on our hardworking healthcare heroes and terrifying to patients across Ontario. 
Will this government finally listen to nurses and implement the solutions they are calling for, starting with repeal of Bill 124? The government house leader. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the member is quite correct. Uh, there has been, a, 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 of course, a great burden on health care uh, 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 providers for a long time in the province of Ontario. And I know the member referenced the fact that she wasn't here, but the reality is that the NDP and the Liberals did work together for many years, and the changes that they refused to make put us in a, a very difficult situation. Now, the Premier, of course, has highlighted many of the investments that we're making, but it didn't just start recently. We started with the transition to Ontario health teams because a lot of people told us that the quality of care that they were getting is good if they could get into the system. So we started the transition to Ontario health teams. We brought on new nurses. We brought on uh, more medical professionals, a medical school in Brampton, a medical school in, uh, in, in Scarborough, so that we could educate more doctors right here in the province of Ontario, keep them here working in communities across uh, the province. We had a low ICU capacity. The Premier said that had to be changed, so we increased ICU capacity across the province Bonds? of Ontario. We're educating more nurses. We're fixing long-term care. It is about building an integrated system that works for all of the people of the province of Ontario, and that's exactly what we're doing. The next question, the member for Nickel Bell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Minister, in July, you received a letter informing you of the closure of the Gogama nursing station on September 1st. Gogama is a small, isolated community. Residents rely on the nursing station as their only access to health care. September 1st is fast approaching, Speaker. Can the Minister reassure the people of Gogama that they will not find themselves without any health care services at the end of the month? Reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think it's very clear that the government has continued to invest. And the member, though, the member raises a very, a very, very important point and something that the Premier, uh, the Minister of Health, uh, have been talking about. In fact, us in long-term care have been talking about right from the beginning. It is that discrepancy between urban and rural uh, rural and remote communities. How do we attract medical professionals into all parts of the province of Ontario? That is something that we focused on. It is something that the Minister of Colleges and, uh, and University has also focused on. The Premier mentioned how we are starting to ensure that uh, tuitions and, and those, those loans that our nurses take uh, will be covered if they serve in, in those areas that are underserviced. So look, uh, the member knows uh, full well, Mr. Speaker, that it is our responsibility, it is the responsibility of the government of Ontario and all parliamentarians to make sure that everybody has access to the top-notch quality health care service that they pay for through their taxes, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to ensure that all parts Response. of this province have the best, highest quality of care, regardless whether they're north, south, east, west, remote, or, or, uh, or, or urban. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, there are health agencies in Timmins right now who are willing and able to sponsor the Gogamma nursing station. They have a nurse practitioner available and they have a supporting physician. Speaker, will the minister make sure that the new agreement is signed ASAP so that the good people of Gogamma and area do not end up without access to care come September 1st? The agreement needs to be signed now. Premier. Well, thank goodness for the people of Timmins. They have a great representative, George Perry. He, 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 you know, the, the other person just, he, he was a no-show, but thank goodness for George. He's going to have a loud voice for Timmins, and he's going to make sure that everyone in that region is going to be taken care of. But this is a broader conversation we need, Mr. Speaker. All premiers across the province uh, you know, and, and territories all have a common voice, and the common voice is this is not going to be sustainable, making sure that the, the feds pay their fair share. We're, we're, you know something, they're paying 22 percent. We're asking for 35 percent. It will not be sustainable without the federal government stepping up to the plate, making sure that they give us our fair amount to sustain the health care system. This, Mr. Speaker, this isn't unique to Ontario. I talk to the premiers every single day. They're facing the same problems. They're facing the same problems down in the U.S. But, Mr. Response. Speaker, we need the federal government to give our fair share of funding for health care across this country. The next question, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. 
Speaker, under the previous Liberal government, rural communities like mine were left behind and neglected when it came to investments that would support our local economy. Time and again, we saw the previous government make announcements that would be supporting investments only in and around the GTA. That's why I am here to continue to advocate for my constituents and the abilities they have to lead our province. On that note, I'm proud that Gray Bruce continues to lead the way in female apprenticeships. For the past five years, we've had more female, exactly, more female students going into skilled trades than the rest of the province by a significant margin. Speaker, what is the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade doing to help support Question. economic growth in my riding? What is the government doing to tap into the amazing workforce potential we have in our community? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, our government listened to listened that rock and we learned about the support that they needed, all those regional challenges they had after a decade of liberal neglect. And that's why we launched the $100 million regional development program to attract investments to southwestern Ontario, southeastern Ontario, and rural Ontario. We knew that this would benefit those many communities who could expect to see growth, job creation, economic opportunities for years to come. And to date, Speaker, those very businesses have invested $716 million into Ontario and created 1,200 jobs in their own communities. Speaker, we're demonstrating that small towns in Ontario can sustain and attract Response. those businesses. We're bringing back that lifeblood to these rural communities, all after the Liberals chased those businesses out of the country. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, for 42 years, under a progressive Conservative government, Ontario became a manufacturing powerhouse, able to compete with any jurisdiction. Yet, under the previous Liberal government, jobs began to leave when high taxes, red tape, out-of-control electricity prices made Ontario one of the least competitive jurisdictions in North America. The result? 300,000 people lost their jobs when Liberal policies forced manufacturing right out of Ontario. With growing instability in Asia, as China attempts to destabilize the region, businesses now, more than ever, are seeking strong, stable partners when it comes to manufacturing operations. Now is an opportunity for Ontario to regain our rightful spot as the manufacturing powerhouse, and we must be taking every and all necessary actions to get Question. it done. Speaker, what is the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade doing to bring back manufacturing jobs to Ontario and to my riding? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, last week, along with the Premier, we buzzed on over to Dundalk, Ontario. Now, there, Greenlit announced a $14.8 million investment to build a 60,000 square foot manufacturing plant. And this project, Speaker, will bring all of Greenlit's production back from China, right here to Ontario. Our province is supporting Greenland's project with $500,000 investment through our regional development program. This is a made in Ontario success story. Greenlid produces compostable products like cups and lids and bowls. Their products are found in 14,000 stores across the continent, and they're made here in Ontario. This is just one of the thousands of examples of products that are made in Ontario and manufacturing that's coming back Spons? to rural Ontario. But we won't stop there, Speaker. We're going to continue to fix that Liberal mess and bring the jobs back to where we need them most. Right. Next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Miigwech, uh, Speaker. My uh, question is to the uh, Minister of Education. Uh, speaker, uh, we learned recently that the Ministry of Education staff were directed to remove parts of the new curriculum that shows students the connections between Indigenous uh, and Western science. Can the uh, minister let us know why he directed his staff to remove these links to 
Indigenous Science content from the ele elementary curriculum. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, on the contrary, in fact, we have enhanced the mandatory learning within the science curriculum in every single grade when compared to 2017 under the former Liberal government. Every single grade in the science curriculum now has enhanced mandatory learning as part of our commitment to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and our commitment to Indigenous, First Nation, and Inuit peoples. Part of the first response of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission actually called us to complete what the Liberals did not do. In the social science curriculum, we will have mandatory learning in this province from grade four to six, but not through one through three. And I joined the Minister of Indigenous Affairs on behalf of the Premier of the government to actually fix that gap. And for the first time this coming September 2023, students in Ontario will learn from grade one right through eight about residential school and the dark chapters the Premier called in Canadian history. We know there is more to do, and I'm open to his feedback and his leadership to get this right. Very Thank good. you. The supplementary question. Uh, speaker, uh, reconciliation is not something is not something that you say differently from the, what the First Nations are saying. That's not reconciliation. I say that because, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, Matawa Council spokesperson Chief Wayne Munias stated that Ontario must stop regressing in their relationship with First Nations. Ontario should be working with First Nations educators to add. Indigenous science to the curriculum, not remove it in secret. Minister, uh, why are you not responding to First Nation education organizations that want to work with you to develop this framework? The Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It gives us an opportunity to talk about the hard work that the Minister of Education uh, and my ministry have done to ensure, Mr. Speaker, a couple of important things. First of all, that Indigenous students are, ar are, are armed with the fundamentals of a good education that includes science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics, and that's embedded in their curriculum, and we support the Indigenous-led uh, education authorities across this, provinces to, uh, across this province to that end. Further, Mr. Speaker, as the minister uh, spoke about, that since the last curriculum update in 2007, Mr. Speaker, no government has taken the steps by comparison that we have to ensure a strengthened Indigenous learning opportunity. For far too long, many of us in this House, Mr. Speaker, learned about our history with words like colonization, war and conquer. Today we're talking about reconciliation, action, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that our Spons. students come home and talk to their parents about some of the darkest chapters of our history and at the same time ensuring Indigenous students across this province have a fair shot at a great education, Mr. Speaker, and a prosperous community to live in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Brampton East. Speaker, from gas to groceries, rising prices continue to impact Ontario workers and Ontario families. Food prices have gone up by almost 10 per cent from a year ago, and rent prices are also rising. In Brampton, Regeneration Outreach Community's local food bank is seeing a rise in families coming through the door at a time when donations are typically lower. There are nearly 400 families coming to them for groceries, a number that has doubled in the last two years. Within Canada's, with Canada's inflation rate reaching, reaching nearly 40, a 40-year 40 high, households across the country are facing increasing pressures to make ends meet. According to Food Banks Canada, one in five people report going hungry, meaning some households are for, uh, foregoing buying groceries in order to pay other bills, including rent, hydro, and fuel. Speaker. What is the Minister of Finance doing to help provide financial support and relief for the people of my riding and all other Ontarians? Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations and welcome to the member from Brampton East. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, for too long, Ontario had a government uh, that ne had never met a fee increase or a tax that they didn't like. <laughs> Cap and trade tax schemes. License t uh, sticker fee increases, road tolls in Durham. They did, they'd love those. But, Speaker, our government knows that the best way to support the people of Ontario is to put more money back into their pockets, yes. not out of their pockets. That's why we signed a deal to bring down the cost of child care and enhanced our child care tax credit to make it even more affordable for families. 
We have enhanced the lift tax credit to deliver an average of $430 in relief in 2022 for low-income workers and families, Mr. Speaker, and we will raise the minimum wage to $15.50 per hour on October 1st, Mr. Speaker. We will never stop investing in our workers, our seniors, and our families. Here, here. The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, the increasing price of gas is driving up the costs of everything from food to groceries and services. In Peel Region, and in particular Brampton, my constituents are struggling to deal with these increased costs. Interest rates are climbing, putting further pressure on household budgets. The people of this province want to build a stronger Ontario, but you cannot build for the future if you're worried about your bills for today. Under the previous Liberal governments, we saw the price, of, uh, the price of housing skyrocket. We saw carbon tax schemes devastate our economy and drive up the cost of everything. We saw red tape strangle opportunity for Ontario businesses and Ontario workers. Speaker, how is this government rebuilding Ontario's economy and keeping costs down for families? Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, you know, geopolitical tensions continue to shake the global economy, but Ontario has every advantage to lead. With a skilled workforce, critical minerals, uh, and the manufacturing capacity, Ontario is becoming a leader, a global leader in electric and hybrid vehicle manufacturing. For, in, Mr. Speaker, in uncertain times, you need a plan. We know the opposition's plan. More regulations, more red tape, higher taxes and higher fees. This government has cut red tape and business taxes to bring investment and good jobs back to Ontario. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we got rid of the cap and trade tax and cut the gas taxes and fuel taxes to give families and businesses relief at the pumps. We have removed the tolls the Liberal government placed on the highway 412 and 418 to give drivers relief. Mr. Speaker, our government's plan will build a stronger Ontario and put more Response. money back in the pockets of the hard-working people of this province. Yeah. Next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, next month, the government will increase ODSP uh, funding by a mere 5 per cent, or $58 per month, to just over $1,200 a month. Meanwhile, Ontario Works recipients will receive no increase, with the government expecting them to live on $733 per month. Think about that, $733 a month. When pressed last week, the Minister of Finance refused to say whether he could live on such meagre rates. It is clear that the government members know it is not possible to survive with any dignity on these rates, but they choose to legislate people into poverty anyway. Will this government do the right thing, change course today, and double the rates for OW and ODSP? The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. To the member opposite for the question. Uh, the Premier has stated that we will support those in need, and our government is taking meaningful steps forward in this very way. That's why we're implementing the largest increase to ODSP in decades. Ontario is, the, is one of the, the only province aligning ODSP payments to inflation. By aligning ODSP rates to inflation, we will help meet the future needs of individuals facing additional financial pressure. And that's not all. We also brought in the lift and care tax credits to support individuals with low incomes, and we brought in dental care to low-income seniors. Supporting our most vulnerable requires all levels of government to come together to achieve real change. We are working with our municipal partners to reform social assistance to focus on people Response. or paperwork. And we're also working with our federal partners to help them deliver on the Canadian Disability Benefit. I will continue to work with Minister McNaughton to make sure that we al allow people to become job ready and get people into the workforce as needed. Thank you. Supplementary question. That sounds wonderful, except that people need the money now to survive. And as if the situation could not get any worse, we learned this morning of serious issues with the government's contracting out of ODSP mail sorting to a for-profit company. This company, Nimble, has created problems in the ODSP mailroom that have led to delays or suspensions of ODSP recipients' files, meaning people aren't able to access the supports they need for medication, 
diabetic supplies and wheelchair repairs. This is right now. This is not something in some distant future. Uh, we also, it's also important to note that the civil service already has a mail room. Why are we contracting out to another private organization to sort the mail, which they are bungling, and then people aren't getting the resources that they need? Thank you very much. The question is, will the government stop the contracting out of ODSP's mail sorting today? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the, uh, for the question to the member opposite. Uh, we know that Ontario Work was always intended to be a temporary measure, but we're looking as a government, how do we help people get into the workforce who can work, and how do we support those who cannot work? And that's exactly why we've created the program that we have done. We're bringing back the central administration into government so that there are more people being able to provide the services at the front line to people who need the job training, the job connections, the networks that is going to allow them to become a productive members of society in meaningful, purposeful work. And that's why the work that I'm, I'm doing with Minister McNaughton is so important to, to create people over paperwork. Uh, and, and you, you mentioned very important aspects of, of efficiencies. We are a person-centered, efficient, and responsive transformation Response. process. That's what we're doing, creating a person at the center of everything we do to allow people to be job-ready and, and part of our economy as we help those who cannot work. Thank you. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, whom I'd like to congratulate on being appointed once again. The farmers of my riding tell me they appreciate your attentiveness and your willingness to meet with them. Speaker, in my riding of Haldeman Norfolk, it is proposed that a city of 40,000 be built upon 42 acres of farmland. This farm and woodland serves as a buffer zone around the Nanticoke Industrial Park near Port Dover. The Ontario Federation of Agriculture warns Ontario is losing in excess of 319 acres of productive farmland each day to development. This is unsustainable. With the announcement to expand powers for mayors with the ultimate goal to accelerate to housing development, Speaker, my question is, what is the ministry doing to protect agricultural lands from developers? To respond, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question very much. And I do appreciate how hard the, the member opposite works on behalf of our agricultural communities in her riding. And with that said, we are all working very, very hard to ensure that we have food security that people can trust across this province, across Canada, and throughout North America. And with that spirit, we are working on innovation and opportunities to increase yield right here at home so that good quality food is available to Ontarians when they need it at the right price. Because we're looking to introduce a food strategy plan later this fall that will speak to um, the importance of secure supply chains so that we can ensure that we're increasing our yields right here at home and intensifying our production so that we can maximize Spons. the opportunities that we have in our lands across this province. The supplementary question. Speaker, the city of 40,000 is a bad idea. Not only would the city be on farmland, but it's also in a provincially significant, significant employment zone, as it is adjacent to one of Ontario's largest oil refining and steel making greenfield complexes. There was nary a mention of agriculture in last Tuesday's speech from the throne. It did stress, however, the need for an additional 1.5 million homes and the fact more people are arriving in the province. This makes most, most of us in rural Ontario nervous as we see developers eyeing up productive lands. In other jurisdictions, Alberta, for example, they have a Provincial Agricultural Land Commission to ensure land is preserved for the future. If we want one thing grown here at home, it must be our food. Speaker, I'm wondering if the ministry is willing to establish such a committee to preserve the lands that feed us. Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and the member opposite knows I'm willing to speak with and meet with farmers anywhere, anytime across Ontario, because this is so, so important. And I'm pleased to share with her that uh, just this past couple of days at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, uh, we had wonderful deputations whereby we met with unis municipalities because they understand and appreciate the importance of food security. And we're going to have a balanced approach. You know, Minister Clark has an, a, a very, um, very good path forward 
in terms of making sure that we're addressing the housing needs, affordable, attainable housing needs that we have across this province, and we'll be balancing it with the importance of food security and, and enabling our farmers to be the best across Canada. And certainly that's something that I can uh, pick up in terms of a conversation and follow up with minister, the minister in Alberta to better understand what they have Response. and see if it's appropriate here in, in the spirit of making sure that we have the balanced approach to making sure we're achieving our goal of the housing need to meet housing needs all the while ensuring that we have food security right here close to home. The next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Speaker. During the last election, the Premier was very clear. He promised to increase ODSP rates. Can the Minister of Community and Social Services confirm here today that in fact we will be helping the most vulnerable and we will be increasing the ODSP rates? Thank you. And to reply, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Our government is supporting those who need it most, addressing this current period of economic uncertainty and preparing for future ones. And that's why we're making the largest increase to ODSP rates in decades. We understand that due to global factors, inflation is rising. And that's why, in our 2022 budget, we are aligning ODSP rates with inflation. So that when the cost of living increases during times of high inflation, rates will too. It is important to our government that the people of Ontario are able to pay for life's essentials, especially our most vulnerable. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you to the minister for that uh, answer, and she knows that it's really only part of the equation. While it's a very welcomed and it's a very welcomed announcement for the most vulnerable who'll be receiving an increase, the minister will know that inflation continues to rise and affect not only Ontarians but everyone in Canada. High interest rates, carbon taxes, which are leading to higher fuel costs, which lead to higher costs at the grocery store, and are wreaking havoc on budgets of the most vulnerable. Can the minister highlight what actions she will be taking to ensure that those who rely on ODSP can expect more stable consistency on fiscal outcomes and that the minister will confirm that she'll be considering making inflation part of the equation with respect to how we govern ODSP rates and how we pay them out in this province? Thank you. Minister. Thank you again for the question. It really is an honour to stand here in the House and speak to this historic investment in social assistance that ties into our work to modernize social assistance to better support the people who rely on it. Our investment to align ODSP with inflation means that annual spending to meet inflation will occur. And that's on top of regular annual funding, like the $8.9 billion in payments issued in 2021-2022. This is more money in the pockets of people who need it most to spend on the essentials of life. And upon passage of the budget, the increase of ODSP rates and their alignment with inflation would be implemented for September, with recipients receiving the new rates from then on. Thank you for the question. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week, a heartbreaking story of a mom and her daughter was published in the Hamilton Spectator. Nicole is the mother to 10-year-old Alexa, who has a rare neurodegenerative condition and receiving palliative care at home. Nicole has had to perform complex, specialized care that neither she nor her husband are trained for because they can't get the hours of care that they need to care for Alexa. Instead of spending time with their daughter, they're filling the gaps of this broken home care system. Can the Premier explain why a child who needs and is eligible for 24-7 care is not eligible and able to get it? Respond, the government has Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I, I do understand what the uh, what the member is saying, and uh, obviously uh, uh, we all want to ensure that we have better outcomes uh, for all people, including uh, uh, her constituent. That is why we really started back in, in 2018. We recognize that uh, not only the home care system, but uh, palliative care, and in fact, the, the greater health system was uh, was in severe. Uh, uh, facing some severe challenges. That is why we made that move to Ontario Health Team so important in beginning the transition of, uh, of our health care system. It then lead to the, uh, led to the uh, uh, connecting to uh, people to 
Community Care Act, which was passed in the, in the last parliament, which has also led to further investments in home care. We understand how important home care is, uh, Mr. Speaker, not only to those who need it, but in ensuring that the health care system is in, uh, is in good shape, whether it's alternative level of care, which occupies some of our hospital beds, uh, Speaker, whether it's seniors having access to, to quality care. We're making Response. significant investments, and as you will know, Mr. Speaker, and the members will have the opportunity uh, uh, soon, uh, the throne speech highlighted a $1 billion investment to improve home care across the province as we modernize the system so that people are not left behind by a system that should have been upgraded many Thank you. And the supplementary question. Back to the Premier. The government's failure to act on the health care crisis is being felt across the board, including home care. Parents are taking on specialized medical care, which they are not trained for in order to keep their child at home and safe. Nicole should be spending this valuable time with her daughter just as her mom, not as her nurse. Families like Nicole's are being expected to just deal with it and figure it out on their own because they don't have a choice. This is completely unacceptable. When will this government properly invest in our health care system so families can expect to receive the promised necessary hours of care that their family members need? And the government house leader. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, the, the transition really started right from the beginning, right, in 2018. And in fact, before, Mr. Speaker, when the Premier talked about ending hallway health care, we knew that if we were going to end hallway health care, we had to make investments in long-term care. We had to make investments in, in home care. But the member is absolutely right. Obviously, uh, when people need care, they should have access to that care, and that is why we are making significant investments in home care. As I said, the member will have an opportunity very shortly to support that $1 billion investment that we're making so that her constituent, all of us, how many of us in our riding have heard the exact same challenge? People having to do more, Mr. Speaker. And while we're always prepared to do more, it is our responsibility as parliamentarians and as a government to ensure that we have the best possible system available, and that is why we are moving so quickly, whether it's on home care, the transition to Ontario health teams, and putting the money behind, behind the policies that we're bringing forward so that constituents like yours can have a better future and all Ontarians can share in that better future. Next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker. The Minister of Environment has been talking a lot about green steel. I wonder if the Minister can tell this House what is the, what is the green steel and what is the electric, electric art furnace, and how will this change the way steel is produced in both Hamilton and Susan Marie, and what impact will this have on jobs and economic growth in both of these municipalities? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Time, I would just like to thank the hardworking men and women, incredible people of Northumberland, Peterborough South, who've elected me. Um, speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford and our government, we've become a leader in clean, green steel. With our government's significant investment, Speaker, Ontario's manufacturing sector is breathing new life. Why does this matter, Speaker? Because in Ontario, it's not through punishing taxes on hardworking families that will ensure a prosperous, clean, green future, but it's through working with and leaning on the ingenuity and work ethic of the men and women of our Ontario steel sector. Men and women like my grandfather, who got off the boat and worked in the steel sector to provide opportunity for my family, Speaker. And thanks to the electrification of the arc furnace, thanks to working collaboratively with all levels of government, this Premier has ensured, through the electrification of the arc furnace, that we are going to see a six megaton reduction Fonts. in greenhouse gas emissions, ensuring jobs for our future, jobs for men and women who choose to choose Ontario for a more prosperous, cleaner future. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the minister's uh, response. Speaker, the minister well, well knows greenhouse gas emissions are how we measure the impact of the climate change. As the minister knows, there are many people who believe Thus, only a carbon tax can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. However, 
what we have seen is this. High gas price leads to higher cost, higher inflation, and the cost of everything going up. So, Speaker, and as you know, there are also many members in this chamber on the opposition benches who advocate for a $200 carbon tax per ton. Speaker, my question to the minister is this. How will this change impact greenhouse gas emission in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of the Environment, Conservation Parks. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that question. Mr. Speaker, this Premier understands that it's not through the all-sizzle, no-stake talk but no action of previous government's platitudes. It's through meaningful action that we're going to find solutions to the climate change problems that face us. It's through working with the steel sector that we've seen significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. It's through moving beyond nimbyism to getting shovels in the ground for record investments in public transit that mums and dads, that seniors are getting on public transit putting the keys down to the car to make it easier to get to work, and through investing in roads, bridges and highways to reduce gridlock, to support a manufacturing sector that's breathing new life, electric vehicles that are powering a cleaner, greener future. Through partnering what? with Indigenous communities in the north, we're seeing a renaissance critical mineral strategy that's going to ensure Ontario is a manufacturing powerhouse in clean, green cars of tomorrow. And I'm proud of that, Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Humble River, Black Creek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The X is opening on Friday, and every year, TSSA safety inspectors and engineers are at the X inspecting every nut and bolt to ensure that people are kept safe. But now, OPSU inspectors are on strike and the society engineers are in conciliation. And, Speaker, the people are rightfully concerned about their safety. What is the Premier doing to get TSSA back to the table to negotiate a fair deal so families can feel safe again? Mr. Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, my ministry is aware of ongoing union negotiations between the TSSA, the OPSU, and the Society of United Professionals. The union negotiations uh, process is an independent process between the TSSA, OPSU, and the society. Mr. Speaker, unlike the oppositions, the safety of Ontarians is our top priority, and the TSSA has already assured me, my ministry, that the operations of the CNE will not be impacted and that all safety inspections are being conducted on time and will be completed ahead of its opening. It is my sincere hope, Mr. Speaker, that both parties can reach an agreement soon so that Ontarians can continue to benefit from the work of the TSSA. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, there are contingency plans not working, and a contingency plan can never replace a safety plan. Since inspectors have been on strike, there have been multiple issues at amusement parks across the province, a miniature train derailment, a fire, multiple ride failures, and it's not just amusement parks. There's been a propane blast in Sudbury, multiple elevator failures, new condominium and other construction is delayed. The list goes on. And Speaker, these inspectors and engineers are also responsible for the safety of so many things, including our nuclear power plants. The public are worried for their safety. What is this government waiting for? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our government is building a stronger Ontario from the ground up, recovering from the pandemic and 15 years of NDP-backed liberal mismanagement of our province. That is why, as part of our pandemic response, our government gave $2.4 million in financial support to the TSSA, providing direct relief to businesses who face significant operational and financial impacts. We also reduced permit and license fee by 75% or 163 businesses operating almost 1,000 amusement devices across Ontario until the end of 2022. Mr. Speaker, I will be heading to CNE with my family, my kids. I encourage all Ontarians to visit CNE, all members to visit CNE. Let's go to the X. Here, here. Thank you. Next question, the member for Oakville. Thank 
you, thank you, Speaker. And my minister, uh, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Job Creation. Speaker, last week the minister said that the government understands the need for advanced manufacturers to invest in the talent and equipment they need to be global leaders. While that is strong advocacy from the government, Ontarians want to know more about exactly how we are achieving these aims. Just as important as investing in our advanced manufacturers, it is also critical that we ensure that we have a robust end-to-end -end manufacturing supply chain. <coughs> My constituents and all Ontarians want us to ensure that materials and production of advanced manufacturing remains in Ontario as much as possible and that we are rebuilding the strength of this sector once again. Speaker, will the minister please explain how the government is attracting investments in advanced aerospace manufacturing supply chains, how exactly our government is Question. making connections with international markets, getting the message out that Ontario is open for business? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, the member is absolutely right. We can't just wait on companies to invest in Ontario's advanced manufacturing supply train. The Liberals tried this. They lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs by doing that. And that's why our government led the Ontario delegation to the Farnborough Air Show just a couple of weeks ago. That trade show draws leading aerospace innovators from around the world for groundbreaking collaboration. Our delegation, we showcased our aerospace, our advanced manufacturing capabilities, but mostly we outlined how Ontario has reduced the cost of doing business by $7 billion annually. It's really simple, Speaker. Ontario is open for business, and we are the gateway to world markets, and we'll continue Response. building on the over 660,000 men and women who go to work every morning in a manufacturing job. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, Speaker, many advanced manufacturing sectors in our province are facing immense global competition: automotive, chemical, medical, transportation, aerospace, just to name a few. In order for us to continue to be a manufacturing superpower once again, the government will need to step up and support these sectors as they innovate and grow. No longer should advanced manufacturing feel abandoned or neglected like they were under the previous Liberal government and the destructive policies that they implemented. Speaker, would the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade please describe what impact the aerospace industry has for the Ontario economy, how Ontario is leading the way in terms of supporting this vital sector and its hardworking men and women? Minister. Space is a vital part of Ontario's advanced manufacturing sector and our supply chain. Bombardier, Airbus, De Havilland, MDA, Mitsubishi, and hundreds more proudly call Ontario home. The industry has 200 firms and employs 38,000 people. There are only five countries in the entire world that manufacture commercial aircraft, and Ontario is in one of those jurisdictions. Last year, we exported $3 billion worth of aerospace products to 186 countries over six continents. We will see this industry continue to provide great jobs in R&D, engineering, and advanced manufacturing. Just last week, we announced that Cycling Response. Manufacturing invested $21.4 million to reshore 22 jobs to Mississauga and Milton from the U.S. That's proof, Speaker, that we are open for business. Next question, the member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas. My question to the Premier. Last week, parents who are both health care workers in Hamilton reached out because they are unable to find childcare for their son. Families all across Ontario are still unable to access the $10 a day childcare that was promised by this government. Our health care system is in crisis, and it's absolutely ridiculous that health care workers can't find childcare during a staffing crisis. So, when will this government ensure that childcare spaces are available for important health care workers and for all parents? The government host leader. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, the government has been working very uh, diligently. I know the Minister of Education, uh, uh, guided by the, uh, the Premier, ensured that uh, Ontario had a deal, a better deal than any other jurisdiction in, in the country, uh, uh, Speaker, and that is uh, a reflection of the fact that Ontario had a much different system, a system that, was, uh, that we inherited, that was 
far more expensive, that was uh, for, far more convoluted. But we have seen, of course, during the pandemic, that the government did step up and make, uh, uh, the minister did step up and make child care available for all of those essential workers, including our health care uh, heroes and a number of other uh, uh, heroes who worked so hard during uh, the, uh, the pandemic. Again, I know the minister has, uh, has ensured that the Ontario families will have a better deal, a longer deal, and will be uh, supported uh, 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 in a way that I think Ontarians expected. Uh, now, of course, uh, for those colleagues who are new, you will remember that it was the NDP who wanted us to sign the Response. very first deal. Uh, we said we're not going to do that, that we could do a better deal. And uh, the Premier ensured, along with the Minister of Education, that we got that better deal for Ontario families. A supplementary question. That answer is not reassuring to any health care worker or any parents in this uh, uh, province that are seeking uh, child care now so that they can go to work in our health care system. Because these health care workers share that in Hamilton, the hospital where they work is at a breaking point, that the wait times for surgery are well, well above the guidelines from Cancer Care Ontario, and that the emergency department is unable to keep up with patient volumes. And this is alarming because it's resulting in more and more code zero ambulance events. When will this government prevent their failures in one sector, childcare, from bleeding over into the health care sector? Government House Leader. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, I, it, it's, it's a, a, a challenging question because, on the one hand, the NDP have been here in the entire time that I've been here since 2018 and have voted against every single measure that we have brought forward to improve the health care system. They voted against the creation of Ontario health teams, which would give us seamless access to health care. They voted against hiring more nurses. They voted against 58,000 new and upgraded long-term care beds. They voted against 28,000 additional PSWs. They voted against initiatives that brought 14,000 more nurses into our, uh, into our health care system. They voted against a new hospital in Brampton. They voted against a new hospital in, Ni uh, in Niagara, Mr. Speaker. They voted against a new hospital, the largest hospital investments in Ottawa and in Mississauga, Mr. Speaker. They voted against all of those things. They voted against the measures that the minister just talked about to support small, medium and large job creators in the province of Ontario, and they voted against Response. every single measure that the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade has brought in to keep our economy moving, to create jobs, to support health care and all of the things that the people of the province of Ontario think is so important. So I say to the, minister, the member, vote with us. Thank you. The next question. The member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. Um, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, it has been months since I approached the government about the serious doctor shortage communities are facing in Algoma, Manitoulin. In Thessalon, the hospital has been trying to recruit permanent physicians since last year. I raised this with the Minister of Health during the last session and presented her with a plan from Huron Shores Family Health Team to create an integrated care model to help recruit and retain new physicians in the area. I asked the Premier, when will this government start working with Northern communities to end physician shortages? To reply, the government house leader. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, we, again, I don't know where the member has been, and I know I know the member asked the question in sincerity because he, I know how hard he works for the people in his community, and I do appreciate uh, the challenge that that, uh, that we've been facing. But we started right from the beginning. We understood, and we're very passionate about this because we understood that health care shouldn't just be for urban centers. It shouldn't just be the university health network and people in, in Toronto who have access to the best quality health care. It has to be urban. It has to be uh, uh, rural. It has to be remote, Mr. Speaker, and that is why we are putting so much investments into the health care system. That's why we're building new uh, uh, medical uh, uh, or, or facilities to train more doctors here in the province of Ontario. That's why we're supporting nurses and asking them, if you will provide service, if you will work in underserviced parts of the province, we will be there for you. We will cover your tuition. It is a program that is brought in by the Minister of, uh, of Colleges and Universities that has been so successful. We brought in training for PSWs so that they, 27,000 additional Bonds. PSWs just in long-term care alone, and we are bringing massive investments in long-term care, including in the, members, uh, in the members' riding. So we are doing everything that we need to do to ensure that the balance is equal across the entire province, and I hope the member will join us in that. Supplementary. 
Speaker, doctors across the province are burnt out right now, especially those working in the north. Their rosters are overloaded in small communities. They are the only point of care immediately available to residents. In many cases, doctors are leaving these communities because they simply cannot keep up with the workload they are expected to take on day after day after day. This has been going on for years, and the government has failed to make the necessary investments to address the problem in the north. Where is the Premier's plan to train, recruit, and retain physicians in northern Ontario? Again, the government has to Again, Mr. Speaker, the member will know that uh, uh, that, uh, that he voted against some of the investments that we did make, some of the specific investments to help bring uh, uh, physicians to, uh, to the north. Uh, an over $7.3 million investment to, uh, to bring 77 new physicians uh, to the north is something that the member voted against, uh, yep. Speaker. The member has voted against all of the investments that we're making in long-term care. Uh, the member has voted against uh, the 27,000 additional uh, health care workers that we're bringing in just for long-term care. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is something that the Premier said before he was even elected, that we had to fix health care in the province of Ontario. We are spending billions of dollars to do it, but it's not, as the Premier has said, it's not just about billions of dollars. It's about making a system work better for generations to come, and that is what we are focused on, and that's the job that we will get done for the people of Ontario. Point of order, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. During question period, I used the word reconciliation. You won't find this in the Oxford Dictionary with its over 600,000 words reflecting a thousand years of English history, nor will you find it in dictionary.com, Mr. Speaker. It is, in fact, inspired by a friend of mine, Jack Trudeau, a member of Serpent River First Nation, and I appreciate his inspiration uh, for that word. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question period's over. This house stands in recess until 1 p.m.